All right, so are electric cars really as green as everyone says they are? I mean, it's a question we get a lot. And to be honest, it's pretty complicated. Yeah, it really is. So for this deep dive, we're taking a look at a source that we thought would be really helpful the EPA's Electric Vehicle Myths page. Oh, that's a great resource. I mean, it's coming straight from a government agency that's tasked with protecting the environment. They're kind of the experts on this. Yeah, for sure. And they're really upfront about addressing some common concerns. Like right off the bat, they tackle the argument that EVs are actually worse for the environment because of emissions from power plants. Right. You know, if the electricity comes from coal or natural gas, aren't we just shifting the pollution somewhere else? Exactly. But they make a really interesting point about energy efficiency. You know, like how much of the energy actually gets used to power the car. Yeah. And that's one area where EVs have a huge advantage. Uh, like you lose something like 75% of the energy in gasoline as heat uh, just from the engine. It's just wasted. But EVs, uh, they can utilize over 85% of the energy from their batteries to actually, you know, move the car. Wow, that's a massive difference. Yeah, it is. So even if the electricity powering an EV comes from a less than perfect source, the EV is still using that energy way more efficiently. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, um, think of it like running a marathon. Okay. You know, a gas car would be like uh, a runner who sprints for a few seconds and then just collapses totally out of energy. Right. But the EV is like that runner who paces themselves and, uh, you know, can actually go the distance. I like that. So even if the EV has a bit of a slower start because of where the electricity is coming from, it wins the race in the end because it's so much better at using that energy. Exactly. It's all about that uh, life cycle perspective. Okay, so speaking of life cycle, let's talk about batteries. I mean, I feel like this is the big one I hear all the time, making those huge EV batteries. Must create a ton of emissions, right? So isn't that worse than just sticking with a gas car? Yeah, I hear that a lot too. And to be fair, the EPA doesn't deny that battery production does have a bigger environmental impact. Uh, at least initially. Yeah, it can be pretty carbon intensive up front, uh, especially when you factor in, you know, mining the materials and the manufacturing process. Right. But the EPA argues that this initial impact is often overblown. Right. Yeah. Like you have to look the entire life of the vehicle. So it's kind of like judging a book by its cover. You can't just focus on that initial impact. You have to see how it plays out over time. Exactly. And there's actually been research on this. Argonne National Laboratory did some really detailed analysis and found that um, even though EV manufacturing might have higher emissions up front, you know, once you factor in the emissions from actually driving the car over its lifetime, the EV usually ends up with a smaller overall footprint. So the long game is where the EV shines. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. But I still have questions about those batteries at the end of their life, you know? Right. What happens to them then? Or are they just destined for landfills? Well, that's a valid concern. And I think it was a bigger problem, uh, you know, a few years ago. But things are changing. Really? Oh, yeah. The U.S. is actually putting a lot of effort into EV battery recycling. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, there are some cool initiatives like the Resale Center, and uh, there's actually a whole national blueprint for developing A&D recycling lithium batteries. Wow, a whole national blueprint. Yeah, I mean, they're really serious about this. So it sounds like the goal is to make those batteries as sustainable as possible. Exactly. They want to create a system where, you know, we recover the materials and reuse them, basically a closed loop. Okay, so they're not just tossing those batteries once they're done. No, not at all. It's not perfect yet, that. but, uh, you know, things are definitely moving in the right direction. It's way more sustainable than it used to be. All right, well, that's reassuring. Now, for a myth that I'll admit, I've fallen for myself, that EV batteries are unreliable and need to be replaced constantly. I mean, come on, my phone battery can barely make it through a day. Oh, yeah, I get that. I think we're so used to, you know, the kind of planned obsolescence with our electronics that it's easy to assume it's the same with EVs. Right. Those batteries are so big. Right. It just seems like they'd be prone to problems. Yeah. But the ETA actually has some data on this and uh, it's pretty encouraging. Oh, OK. Let's hear it. So less than half a percent of EV batteries from models made since 2016 have failed. Wow. Less than 0.5 percent. 
That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. And get this, they found that 97.5% of EVs are still using their original batteries. So basically, my phone battery is more likely to die than my EV battery. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, yeah. they do degrade over time, like all batteries do. Right, yeah. But the average range for an EV still far exceeds what most people need for their daily driving, you know, here in the U.S. Mm. Okay, that's good to know. That definitely eases my mind a bit. Yeah, good. Okay, let's zoom out a little and talk about the big picture. Um... Because I keep hearing this argument that the growing number of EVs on the road is going to overload the power grid and cause blackouts. I mean, it sounds a little dramatic, but is there any truth to that? Well, it's definitely a question that deserves, you know, a serious look, not just dismissed as like, you know, fear mongering. Right. Yeah. I mean, more EVs will mean higher demand for electricity. Right. But it's not going to happen overnight. You know, we have time to adapt. And uh, more importantly, I think we have the tools to do it. Okay, so what kind of tools are we talking about? Well, for one, there's smart charging. Okay. So imagine, you know, you get home from work, you plug in your EV, but it doesn't actually start drawing power from the grid until, say, 2 a.m. when everyone's asleep and the demand is way lower. So it's like scheduling your dishwasher to run overnight. Uh, exactly. Okay. It's all about, you know, managing the load. And plus, um, research actually suggests that the U.S. power grid already has enough capacity to handle the growth of EVs, you know, at least for the next few years. Okay. So it's not an immediate crisis. No, not at all. And here's a fact that might surprise you. The average U.S. household actually uses more energy for water heating and air conditioning than they would for charging an EV. Really? My water heater is using more energy than a car. Yeah, it, it's true. Wow, okay. So, I mean, obviously long term, you know, we will need upgrades to the grid, but the Department of Energy is already working on that uh, with their Build a Better Grid initiative. So it's not a matter of if, it's just when. Yeah. Pretty much. They're basically future-proofing our electricity infrastructure. Well, that's good to know. So it sounds like we're not all going to be plunged into darkness because everyone's plugging in their EVs. No, definitely not. Okay, good. Now let's talk about maybe the most common myth I hear. There's nowhere to charge an EV. You know, like you're just going to be stranded on the side of the road with a dead battery. Oh, the classic range anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I don't think people realize just how many charging stations there actually are now. Yeah, I think a lot of people's perception is kind of stuck in like, you know, the early adopter days of EVs when it really was harder to find a place to charge. Right, right. But things have changed dramatically. There are over 72,000 public charging stations with, get this, 196,000 ports across the U.S. Wow, that's a lot of ports. Yeah, it is. And that number is just going to keep going up, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially with the infrastructure bill. Right. The bipartisan infrastructure law is putting a lot of funding into building out a national EV charging network. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, people also forget that you can actually charge an EV from a regular household outlet. Wait, seriously? Like... The same outlet I use for my toaster. Yeah, it's called level one charging. Yeah. It's slower, obviously, you know, ideal for overnight charging at home, but it works. And then for faster charging, there's level two, which uses a 240 volt outlet, like what you might use for a dryer or something. Okay, so they are options. Lots of options. Even if you don't have, you know, a fancy home charging setup. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even apartment and condo dwellers are starting to see charging stations become like standard amenities yeah which is great i mean it really shows that things are changing so they're thinking about charging at every level i love it all right well we've covered a lot of ground already but there's still more to explore yeah we've got to talk about range anxiety and safety and... so much to discuss we'll be back in a minute to dive into even more ev myths so another big one is electric vehicles don't have enough range to handle daily travel demands you know everyone's worried about getting stranded with a dead battery oh totally my aunt is convinced she needs a gas car because she drives to visit family a couple times a year. Yeah, I think a lot of people have that fear. But, you know, the data actually tells a different story. The EPA found that in 2022, more than 73% of all trips in passenger vehicles were less than 10 miles. Seriously? Less than 10 miles? Yeah, and almost all trips, like 98%, were less than 75 miles. So unless you're driving across the country every day, you're probably fine with an EV. Exactly. And most EVs on the market today can go over 200 miles on a single charge. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. It is. And even the ones with the shortest range can still travel over 100 miles. Okay, so that covers most people's daily needs. But I do know that range can vary depending on, like, 
how you drive and the weather. Yeah, absolutely. Just like with a gas car, if you're driving aggressively or it's super cold out, that can affect how far you can go. So it's something to be mindful of, but it sounds like range anxiety might be a bit overblown for most drivers. I think so. Okay, so what about safety? I mean, we are talking about cars with giant batteries. I feel like I've heard people say EVs are less safe than gas cars. Yeah. Myth number seven is electric vehicles are less safe than comparable gasoline vehicles. You know, some people are worried about those batteries being a hazard. Right. But the thing is, safety is a huge priority, and EVs have to meet the same strict standards as any other car on the road. They have to pass the same crash tests and safety evaluations to meet the federal motor vehicle safety standards. So no cutting corners when it comes to EV safety. No way. And in fact, they often have some additional safety features, like, for example, they're designed to automatically shut down the electrical system in case of a collision. Well, that's smart. Yeah, it helps prevent electrical shocks and fires. That makes sense. I always just kind of assumed those big batteries would be, you know, dangerous in an accident. Yeah, that's a common concern, but those safety features really address that. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, the Department of Energy's Alternative Fuel Data Center has a ton of information on EV safety. Oh, perfect. We'll definitely link to that in the show notes. Okay, so we've debunked a lot of myths about EVs being bad for the environment. But even if they are better, they're still pretty expensive, right? Yeah, that's true. The upfront cost of an EV can be higher than a gas car, but you have to think about the bigger picture. Okay, so what am I missing? Well, first of all, there are often government incentives and tax credits that can really help bring the price down. Oh, right. I have heard about those. Are they pretty significant? Yeah, they can be. Depending on where you live and the specific EV you're looking at, you could get thousands of dollars back. And don't forget, the cost of owning an EV over time is often lower because you're not paying for gas. Right, right. And EVs tend to need less maintenance because they have fewer moving parts. Oh, that's a good point. Fewer things to break down or replace. Exactly. So it might cost more upfront, but you could save money in the long run. So it's kind of like that tortoise and the hare thing again. Exactly. It's about playing the long game. Okay, that makes sense. But there's still the issue of, like, all the materials needed for those batteries, right? Are we just creating new problems by mining all those rare metals? Yeah, that's a really important question. The environmental impact of mining is definitely a concern. It's like we're just swapping out one set of problems for another. Right, and we need to make sure those materials are being sourced responsibly and ethically. It's not just about switching to EVs. It's about making the entire process sustainable. So it's like we need to make sure we're not creating a whole new set of environmental problems in the process of trying to solve the old ones. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it sounds like the environmental benefits of EVs are real, but there's still a lot of work to do to make sure the whole system is truly sustainable. Yeah, it's a journey. It is. And speaking of journeys, what about the future? What are some of the things on the horizon that could make EVs even better and more appealing? Well, I have to ask, what's coming next for EVs? What's the future look like? Ooh, that's the fun part. There are some really cool things in the works, but I think one of the most game-changing is going to be solid-state battery technology. Solid-state batteries. Okay, I feel like I've heard about those, but I don't really know much about them. What's so special about them? Well, think of it this way. Imagine an EV battery that can store even more energy. Okay, so more range. Yeah, more range, but it's also potentially safer and uh, maybe even cheaper to produce than the lithium-ion batteries we use now. Whoa, hold on. More range, safer, and cheaper. That sounds almost too good to be true. I know, right? It's a pretty big deal. But how do they actually work? What makes them so different? Well, traditional lithium-ion batteries use a liquid or a gel electrolyte to, uh, you know, move the ions around inside the battery. Okay, right. But solid-state batteries, well, they use a solid electrolyte. So no more liquid sloshing around. Exactly. And that makes them a lot more stable, which means they're less likely to, uh, you know, overheat or catch fire. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So it's a safety thing, too. Yeah, definitely. And because they're more stable, you can pack more energy into the same space so you get more range. Wow. So it's like multiple benefits all rolled into one yeah pretty much they could also pot potentially charge faster like way faster no that would be a game changer yeah have more waiting around for hours at a charging station right 
Okay, so are these uh, magical batteries already in EVs that I can buy? Well, not quite yet. The technology is still pretty new. Okay. But a lot of car companies are putting a ton of money into developing them. Really? Yeah, some experts think we could see them in EVs by like the end of the decade. That's sooner than I thought. <laughs> okay, so solid state batteries are definitely something to keep an eye on. What else is in the pipeline, uh, you know, to make EVs even more awesome? Well, another really cool technology is wireless charging. Wireless charging, like for my phone. Yeah, but for your car. Imagine just pulling into your driveway and your car starts charging automatically. No cables or plugging in, just magic. Whoa, hold on. I can just park and it charges. Yeah, it's pretty mind blowing. Okay, but how does that even work? It uses something called electromagnetic induction. So basically there's a charging pad on the ground and it sends energy wirelessly to a receiver on the bottom of the car. So it's kind of like those wireless phone chargers, but supersized? Yeah, exactly. And it makes charging so much easier, especially for people who might have trouble, you know, plugging in a cable. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. Accessibility is so important. Yeah, definitely. And no more tripping over cords in the garage. That's a bonus. <laughs> okay, so wireless charging sounds amazing, but are there any uh, downsides? Well, there are a few things they're still working on. Like it's not as efficient as plug-in charging yet. So you lose a little bit of energy in the transfer. Okay. So there's a little bit of an energy debt. Yeah. But they're working on making it more efficient and it's also more expensive right now. But as with any new technology, you know, the price will probably come down as it becomes more widespread. It always seems like there's that, uh, initial hump to get over with new tech before it becomes, you know, really affordable and mainstream. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so wireless charging sounds like it has a lot of potential, but, you know, even with all these amazing advancements in battery technology and charging, it's not just about the cars themselves, right? You're absolutely right. We have to think about the whole transportation system. We can't just, you know, slap a new battery on an old unsustainable system and call it a day. Exactly. So what needs to change? Well, we need to design our cities differently. I mean, think about cities that are designed for people, not cars. Okay, yeah, I like that. You know, with walkable neighborhoods, safe bike lanes, and really good public transportation that connects seamlessly with, you know, EV charging hubs. So it's about creating a whole ecosystem that makes it easy and appealing to choose sustainable options. Exactly. Whether it's an EV, a bike, a bus, or even just walking. And it's not just about convenience, it's about affordability too, right? I mean, we need to make sure sustainable transportation is accessible to everyone, not just people who can afford a fancy new car. That's so important. It shouldn't be a luxury to live sustainably. It should be the norm. Absolutely. And we can't forget about the bigger picture here. We need to make sure we have clean energy to power those EVs and that the materials for the batteries are sourced responsibly and that we have policies that prioritize sustainability at every level. It's a lot to think about. It is. It's a complex system, but it's definitely worth figuring out. And it sounds like we're making progress, yeah. even if there's still a long way to go. Yeah, I agree. It's not about being perfect. It's about moving in the right direction. And what's really exciting is that there's so much innovation happening in this space. Yeah, it feels like we're on the cusp of some really big changes in how we get around. I think so, too. Well, this has been an amazing deep dive. Thanks for breaking it all down for us. My pleasure. And for all of you listening out there, I think the takeaway here is that the future of transportation is in our hands and there are a lot of exciting possibilities on the horizon. So stay curious, stay informed, and stay engaged. I love it. Every choice we make, every conversation we have can make a difference. That's a great note to end on. Thanks again for joining us on this deep dive into the world of electric vehicles. We'll be back soon with another fascinating exploration.